Good afternoon. As Todd said, my name is Clara Villarosa, and I'm the president of Villarosa Media, which is a publishing company that uh, publishes primarily African American books. We came into being after the tsunami hit the publishing industry. Uh oh. I left something. My speech. You see it? There it is in your hand. No, is that it? Yeah. Oh. Ah, good girl. <laughs> and thank you, Ta. Lisa brought it. Um, I started the Human Bookstore in Denver, Colorado in 1982. I had it for 16 years, worked hard, but couldn't make it move it beyond about $300,000 a year, no matter what I did. So I decided to retire, sell the store, and move to New York. I was persuaded to open another human, and my thought was, why would I do that? Then I was walking up and down 125th Street, now keep in mind, I'm from Denver, Colorado. In Denver, Colorado, there were five black people in me. And <laughs> six. And um, when I walked up and down 125th Street, I said, they're black people. They're shopping. They're walking up and down the street. Maybe I could make a successful bookstore work here. So I said, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to take all that I know, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to start down this path and see how far I get. Well, in 2003, I opened what was the largest African-American bookstore in the country. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story. While I was in Denver, I claimed that Hugh Mann was the largest African bookstore in African-American bookstore in the country. Of course it wasn't, but I named it, I claimed it, and there actually was a larger store and it was in Dallas. But I was so forceful and persuasive that she didn't even question me and neither did anyone else. My daughter says, Mother, you can't say that. And I said, why not? She said, well, so suppose somebody says you're not. So I lied. What are you going to do? So she, I'm in Denver. She's in New York. She calls me in the middle of the night. She says, Mom, guess what happened? Somebody just came back from Denver, Colorado, and they visited the largest black bookstore in the country. And I says, oh, my God, that's my mother. It's working. So I had to make it so, which I did. The bookstore, after three years, made a million dollars in New York, in Harlem, because of course we had the population. Um, I retired from the bookstore, wrote two books, and then my daughters asked me at the age of 80, let's start another business, let's start publishing, and that's how we started it. Now, as you mentioned, as uh, Todd mentioned, Linda is uh, one daughter, I have two daughters, and so it's the three of us, a mother and two daughters. Linda's the editor. She not only worked at the um, uh, Essence Magazine, but she worked at the New York Times. And my other daughter, she's a jack of all trades. She does a whole bunch of things. But what I realize she does best is when I wrote my book, I wrote it, it was called First Steps, down to business, first 10 st steps for entrepreneur, of entrepreneurship for women. 
I finished it. I was ready to submit the manuscript, and my daughters read it, and they said, oh, my God, mother, you can't turn this in. You will embarrass us. And my daughter said, I said, well, what should I do? She said, don't worry. Finish it. I'll take it. The daughter that I did, um, is the jack of all trades, she did that. When she finished that book, I said, wow. Did I write that? She says, yes, you did. I took your voice and made it into a much more readable book. So these, this is what we bring to the table. We recognize that it's very difficult now for African Americans to get their books published. So we're pro providing an opportunity for this to happen. And so that's why we developed Villarosa Media. Our first book was The Wind is Spirit, The Life, Love, and Legacy of Audre Lorde. Now, by Gloria Joseph. It's a bio-anthology. A bio is a biography. So somebody's talking, and an anthology is a collection of other people's voices. Now, to show you how challenging it was on our first book, when we got the manuscript, it was 500 pages. Now, uh-huh. Uh so that meant it, we had to whittle it down. Now, the author is an academician. She's great. She's, a, um, she's written for journals. She's um, done a significant amount of writing, but mostly it's academic. And she's an island woman, so you don't touch any one of those words, okay? But we had to touch those words and delete, delete, delete to get it down to 300 pages. But that's what we did to make it readable because we, although there are many books written about Audre Lorde, we knew that, but none could, or most of them were critical of her, uh, criticisms of her work. They were critical, and uh, academic, and also very literary. We wanted a readable book that told her story. And so Gloria said, let me tell you how I got into this. Gloria Joseph was Audre Lorde's partner for the last 10 years of her life. And if you know about Audre Lorde, the last, 10, the last few years she died of cancer. And so Gloria collected as her partner, collected materials, and then at one point, Audrey, before she died, said to her, I want you to Gloria, says Audrey, to write my story. Really, thought Gloria, what do you want me to say? Other people said, no, no, no. I want you to write my story, and I want you to promise me that you will write it and write it in a way that my story will tell who I am in all my complexities and to make the quality of my life so irresistible that other people will share my visions. I really want people to know how hard I tried with what I had. I also want them to know that I play with toys in the bathtub and I can be as stubborn as a mule, which sometimes is good and sometimes not. I also want them to know I'm talking, that I'm talking about enabling people to be the best that they can be, to use themselves the best they can, and to show here's the way I did it. But it's not a question of following me. It's like a poem. I believe passionately in the power of poetry. A poem doesn't tell you how to act and how to feel. It inspires you. It inspires something inside of you. So I would like for my life to inspire black women, all people actually, in a particular way. I want you to tell my story in your way, but also tell my story. Well, we got what Gloria collected were hundreds of 
pictures, travel logs, and then she went and talked to 50 women and asked them to write a piece about their experience with Audre Lorde and how she impacted on their lives. Now, some of those contributors were Sonia Sanchez, Angela Davis, Jewel Gomez, Janetta Cole, Michelle Cliff, who just recently died, Asada Shakur, Barbara, Stewart, Barbara Smith, and her daughter, Elizabeth. They often spoke and used prose, but many of them were poets, so they wrote poems about Audre Lorde. Now, within that, this 500 pages, we had to take the voices of 50 people, integrate it into a book, and make it very readable so that it flowed. It's not necessarily chronological, but it does touch their lives and touch Audrey's life and inspires, inspired them, and hopefully it will inspire you if you read the book. Now, we think of Audrey Lord as an activist, a poet. She was very outspoken. I'm going to read to you a piece that was written by Gloria's nephew. And it was, it's about Audrey Lord, the New York State Poet Laureate. That occurred in 1991. Now, I'm going to set the stage for it a bit. From the moment, says Mark Green, from the moment I arrived at the ceremony, it was clear that while there may have been, this was a social component to the afternoon, this was really not a social event. The stature of the, the statue of the ceremony cannot be overstated. The event was choreographed to give deference to the speakers, and the keynote speaker was William Kennedy, the Pulitzer Prize winning author of numerous novels. The program began and proceeded with the introduction of Mr. Kennedy, along with a summary of his work. From his introduction, he talked about his standing as a national and international literary figure. He also proceeded to thank the governor for the opportunity in doing so referenced so many people and pleased to have been there. Mr. Kennedy began to introduce Norman Mailer, oh, who appeared to know Mr. Kennedy intimately. So the scene was set, a, set, a very impressive group of people all speaking highly of each other in a very impressive setting. Then Audrey takes the podium and artfully, beautifully, and abruptly puts an end to all the pleasantries through a heartfelt speech. From the first sentence, first sentence, she questioned how she, as a poet, African American, woman, feminist, could accept the award from a state and country that was doing so much to oppress people, particularly people in group that she participated in. There was no question that Audrey's first sentence had just intellectually punched the United States and the state of New York squarely in the face regarding their policies and priorities. And I was sitting on a front row seat. The entire audience understood what was happening. And it seemed as if everyone in the room sat up in their seats all at the same time. Audrey continued in a call and response style asking how she could accept the award when the United States or and the New York State was doing something that she would describe very specifically, point by point after point, that was oppressing one or 
many of the segments of society that she represented. She then paused and responded by saying that she accepted the award for those artists, women and African Americans who, in spite of these obstacles, continued to move forward. The applause started, which did not dull at any, in any way the poignant nature of Audrey's commentary. She focused the spotlight on the differences between people, the increased poverty in America, the increased military spending, the contrast in health care for the minorities, and gave a voice in a room filled with the accepted and the accomplished to the voiceless. The poets who are oppressed, silenced, disenfranchised, who write on scraps of paper in homeless shelters, in mental health wards, in prison, and squalid reservations. When it came to the policies of the New York State, the presence of the governor, 15 feet away from the podium, did not soften Audrey's remarks either. Audrey kept going and took it from an intellectual experience to a personal one for the core group, and it was clearly personal for her. She noted that New York, in its history, its backroom dealings, its old boy networks, its regularly excluded the public, had become accustomed to the practices that were happening today. And she said to all the recipients, this is where the event took a true significance because or do challenge the policies of the New York State, questioning how they could be asked to represent, how she could be asked to represent a state that foot, stood for such oppression. Audrey was making a difference right there before my eyes, causing change to happen with each sentence she spoke, causing accomplished, influential people to take note and rise to the occasion. She was embracing her black lesbian mother warrior poet that she called herself. And I now understood. Her perspective was clearly rooted in the experience of the African American and the feminist and others. She was a fearless woman and she had no problem speaking her mind and letting people know, uh-uh, I'm going to tell it like it is. The governor was moved to the point that he felt he had to respond in a very meaningful way. And he very skillfully modified his keynote speech to incorporate what she said, turned to her and thanked her for her remarks. This was done, it was done, and she went from aunt, mother figure, to warrior. When the speeches ended, my aunt, mother, aunt Audrey Lord, returned and began joking with all about all the trivialities of the day. Yes, she spoke her mind. Audrey went to Germany. And while she was there, she spoke to the Afro-Germans. They had never heard or seen anyone like her. They were a lesbian group, sort of pulled in, scared. And the Ordi says, no, 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 come on out of your shell, come on. When we began to call ourselves black Germans or Afro-Germans, we were, not trying to stress out our parental or origins. We were just trying to share those experiences. But my experience interacting with Audrey Lord made me realize, says the Afro-German woman, that I could not separate the meaning she had for the Afro-German movement and from the meaning it had for me personally. Since I was part of it, and since I cannot separate my political work from my private life anymore, Audrey says, we all begin to see each other as we 
dare to begin to see ourselves. We will begin to see ourselves as we dare to see each other. This was an important message to me. Together, me, other Germans that I knew, we started to look within ourselves to pull out that black part, to be proud of it. We are black Germans and we have to get used to being ignored, but we have a voice. Audrey Lord was a sister, a mother, a companion in struggle. She paved the way for us. She was inspiring, she loved, and she was powerful, and she made us feel equally as powerful. With her poems, she sang her thoughts into my heart. She strengthened me to fight for all my rights, together with other black women, black people all over the world, and to claim our dignity from our society. Her life work is a legacy, a legacy to me and a source that will always nourish my life and my work and my human rights. Why is Audre Lord important today? We all need role models. We all need words of encouragement and we all need to be inspired. Sometimes we silence our voices and we say, we can't be heard. It's too much noise out there and we can't be heard above the noise. Audre Lord says, forget about the noise. Speak up, speak out, be heard. You never know where it's going to fall. It's, her voice stimulates us to be activists and also for us to be warriors Sometimes it's difficult, but it doesn't matter. Speak up. Silence is silence. We cannot afford to be silent. Then we can, then we are ignored. So speak up, speak out, be heard. Thank you. Uh, at this point, <laughs> I always ask if there's any questions or comments. How many of you have heard of Audre Lorde? Okay. Tell me what you've heard or what you know. So I'm going to encourage you to buy this book so you get to know more. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. She read the cancer journals? Yes. In the book, we, uh, there's a part where her physician talks about Audre Lorde. And Audre Lorde talks about what she did to try to live, taking, doing different things in order to re reach beyond the medical profession, to look, remember, she was living in St. Croix at the time, and she was trying to find different types of remedies because she wanted to live. But at one point, she had to say, I have to let go. And so the words are very inspirational here 
and when you hear her doctor speak about Audrey and her daughter speak about her mother at the end, Elizabeth. Because for Elizabeth, it was very important for her to hear and listen to her mother. Her daughter, Elizabeth, is a physician. Anyone else want to say about, speak about Audrey Lord? And you have heard of her. Okay. Okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I encourage you to read our book, and hopefully you will be inspired. Okay. We're ready for it? Yes. Okay. Yes. There's a whole... Audrey um, was asked to speak in Berlin. And she, matter of fact, she went several times. And so once she got there, they had set everything up. And it really wasn't to the Afro-Germans. Uh, and so while she was there, she said she was invited to speak and invited to speak at a university, a school. And she said, well, where the Afro-Germans. So she found them, pulled them together because they were not included. And But she, her reputation preceded her in Germany and so she was asked to speak and they paid and so forth. And she went back and so what she did, uh, what was so impressive about what she did how she identified the Afro-Germans, helped them to come together in a way that they could become empowered. She spoke all over the world. And when uh, one of the things, she had three memorial services and three places that she wanted her ashes spread. So there were ceremonies. There were six different ceremonies. <laughs> 